So uh, two announcements. Uh, one is that we are functioning under the Linux Foundation antitrust policy such as it is. Uh, you can read more about it at the Linux Foundation website, uh, which is linked to from the meeting website. The other is a play to be uh, have the proper co code of conduct, which is basically do not be disagreeable even when you're disagreeing. I mean, that's in a nutshell what it says. Plus giving people uh, an opportunity to talk, other people opportunity to talk, especially when you're questioning uh, the presenter. And today's uh, presenter is uh, Stephen Phillips, who is no stranger to us. He has been here before. Uh, at that time, he was talking about uh, DXCD, uh, the, uh, or Dcash, which is a central bank digital currency that is actually in production or in pilot at least um, in contrast to people who just keep talking about this stuff. So that's a, that's a plus. Uh, so I know that smaller jurisdictions are the ones who have you know created most of these, uh, but some big guns are going to hit this uh, space, China, as we know, and uh, India sort of has started its uh, rollout. Um, maybe uh, later this year, they are coming out with the pilot. There is going to be uh, Turkey. And Stephen is uh, well-placed to talk about this. Uh, so he will uh, guide us through the architecture problems and promise, most of all, of uh, what it means to have a central bank digital currency in play. Uh, thank you. And uh, Stephen, please uh, start your presentation and we will um, ask questions when we have a chance later. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, so as Vipin mentioned, I did uh, speak a few months ago where uh, I did a presentation and there were a number of interesting slides on that presentation. I encourage the audience to visit that presentation. There I talked about the architecture of BITS technology and um, it was prior to go live in the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union. This is a current, this is the oldest currency union in the world uh, that now has the Dcash the digital EC dollar uh, live in a pilot. So I do encourage the audience to revisit that presentation. There's a lot of background information there. So for today, I want to begin with a brief background on BIT. Uh, this is the fintech company that I'm the vice president of special projects with. And uh, from there, we will talk briefly on the problem that the digital currency was developed and designed to solve. And we want to get to the lessons learned from bringing the Dcash, the CBDC to market and talk about some of the key lessons that we learned and some of the things we might do differently, et cetera, as we progress and deploy in new markets. So I'll begin with a brief background on BIT. Uh, BIT was founded in 2013. In 2016, we were the first company in the world to digitize a national currency on blockchain. And we, and, you know, that's the synthetic CBDC at the time. And we had the support of the central bank governor and the minister of finance. This system is still operational today and uh, continues to grow. We are integrated with the largest bill payment processor in Barbados and also major telecoms for added value to users and online payments. 
Since then, 2016, we've continued to evolve our digital currency management system to enable central banks of all sizes to digitize their national currency. The BIT DCMS digital currency management system includes the necessary applications for all major stakeholders to transact in digital currency. So that includes central banks as the monetary authority, the financial institutions, merchants, businesses, and also consumers. So it's a two tier system that we have currently. And most central banks globally are configuring their CBDC deployments in the two tier fashion. So BIT was key to the development and successful launch of the central bank digital currency pilot within the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union. And that is managed and the monetary authority there is the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank. This uh, technology, this new digital version of the EC currency went live in March 2021. So we are just about at the six month mark, a good time to revisit this audience and talk about some of the lessons that we've learned in those initial six months since go live. So we've currently deployed, thinking specifically about the um, Dcash deployment, we are currently deployed in five territories and um, we are due to deploy in the additional three territories that make up the currency union, a total of eight, um, and that's planned uh, by the end of October at latest. So with this project and our other ongoing projects, we bit as a company plan to be in three continents by the end of Q1 2022. And uh, as Vithin was mentioning, we, we also just recently were awarded a contract for the giant of Africa, Nigeria. So that's, that's a very big player, the largest economy in Africa that's also making a move towards CBDC to uh, address problems that they experience within their uh, economy. So let's talk uh, more specifically about the digital Eastern Caribbean dollar and the lessons that we learned there. Um, it's, it has been a significant, innovative and proactive step in the right direction to address problems of high cost and payments inefficiencies within the oldest monetary union in the world. And that union, again, is the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union, made up of eight territories within the Caribbean islands. According to data from the ECCB, Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, outgoing regional transfer costs, outgoing regional transfers can cost anywhere between 60, between 30 and 63 US dollars per transaction. A final settlement of checks, card payments, and wire transfers can take up to three days. So as you can see, there's a lot of inefficiencies and high cost um, within the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union for making payments and settling transactions. And this technology that we have worked with the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank to provide is meant to address a lot of those problems by providing instant payment and settlement, as well as reducing costs significantly for these transfers, as well as addressing additional issues such as financial inclusion for digital payments and um, generally making it easier to transact for merchants, et cetera. So lessons learned from bringing the CBDC to market. So here is where I move into some of the things that I can share that we've learned along the road that we will definitely take to our um, additional deployments as the company continues to grow and succeed. So when considering some of these challenges of launching a CBDC, you know, it's almost automatic to assume that these challenges will be technical and operational. But what we've found is, is that while those challenges do exist, the, the real big factors to consider are those that are more subtle, cultural or economic. You know, logistical go-to-market challenges, especially uh, in a world where there is a global pandemic also presented some challenges for us. And it's important that you address these challenges head on to ensure a successful CBDC launch. So ranging from instinctive 
disinclinations from target demographics towards adopting new technologies to difficulties inherent in attempting to convey value propositions. So in this particular um, um, demographic of users, there is a natural disinclination for new technologies, especially around those to do with finances. We have in some of the territories, aging populations, individuals who want to see things written in a book, et cetera. So launching a, a novel technology such as a CBDC did present a lot of challenges. So one of the first lessons, well, the first lesson I'll touch on is the fact that communication is key. Being able to communicate clearly and succinctly the value proposition of the CBDC is not enough. While it's important, it's not enough to drive adoption. These propositions need to be tangibly and comprehensively conveyed to prospective users and their target demographics. The biggest challenge we face by the ECCB, faced by the ECCB in bringing Decash to market was the cultural disposition present within the ECCU, the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union, to adopt new technologies where you know, individual citizens were not necessarily rushing to adopt new technologies. So we found that providing users with clarity around the advantages um, can encourage them to think about the value of the product, thereby cre creating demand for it. Which, ult which may ultimately drive adoption and uptake. So that clarity around why I should be interested in this, what is it going to do for my life? How is it going to benefit me? How is it going to save me time or reduce my costs? That is super important to get users to change. And as we know, humans are, are creatures of habit and it's difficult to effect change. So driving home those value propositions is super important. All right, so the other, the other interesting item, a lesson that we learned is leveraging local and industry expertise. Central banks historically have not had to develop go-to-market strategies for digital products uh, or marketing campaigns. You know, as you could imagine, the adoption of physical notes and coins issued by the monetary authority has been a legal requirement. So they haven't had this is novel for central banks as well, having to create go-to-market strategies, marketing campaigns, and driving adoption of a digital product. So what we found, working alongside dedicated local teams of experts who have considerable experience bringing financial technology project products to market was very beneficial in the rollout of Decash. And we see that in other markets where we have our CBDCs being deployed. But it will, also be, it will also be essential in ensuring that the network and associated applications are well received and well used by the target demographic. Drawing on domestic expertise to incorporate regional cultural messages and tactics is also very important. Gaining insight from these experts and involving them in the rollout of the strategy in, in the jurisdictions can help ensure operating experience is leveraged, is leveraged and successful behaviors are considered and adopted. It's therefore important we have a diverse team to help with the rollout for a CBDC. So those individuals, again, who understand the market very well, they will be critical you know, and those lessons that they can bring to the table about what works, what doesn't work, how to communicate effectively to the target demographic, very important to ensuring um, that you can hit those key performance indicators for success. Central, central banks should also consider involving local payment service providers to participate in CBDC deployments. Having well-known payments applications integrate with a CBDC network has the potential to provide quicker adoption and easier onboarding for customers who are already accustomed to sending and receiving money using uh, their given payment service providers application. There will likely, however, still be marketing efforts required on behalf of the central bank, but it would revolve around areas better suited to their expertise, such as education, improving financial literacy, economics, and assurance. 
as opposed to having the central bank drive user adoption. So in many cases, the consumers wouldn't even be aware of this. They would be using the same application. Go ahead. Um, do you have a presentation that you're looking at or is it, uh, you know? Just, just no, it's no presentation today. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, where was I? Right, so we we're discussing that in many cases, the consumer wouldn't even necessarily be aware of this. They would be using the same application from their payment service provider. However, by the payment service provider leveraging the CBDC, it can create opportunities to move for the payment service provider to move away from their private ledger and now leverage the CBDC uh, infrastructure, which would be presumably a safer asset to provide to their customers. One of the other lessons we have is extending the reach of Dcash. Uh, so while the above may be highly useful and effective for seeding the network, and it is somewhat limited to the fact that it only reaches users who are currently serviced by financial institutions and payment services providers that integrate with the CBDC network. Users may very well already be more inclined and accustomed to accepting digital project products. A big part of projects such as the Dcash pilot, which we are talking about the lessons learned, is financial inclusion. So reaching people unaccustomed to using digital project products such as the unbanked or the banked who can't access certain instruments, facilities, or services. A significant part of the CBDC rollout um, then needs to engage with this disconnected, if not disenfranchised demographic. And again, this is specific to the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union, where they may be higher than normal when you think globally. Uh, levels of um, uh, unbanked or underbanked individuals. So the lesson learned here is leveraging what we call loosely boots on the ground. So this is a, a physical present, uh, individuals who can provide in-person outreach. And we found this very effective. Uh, see, and the, CB, CB, the ECCB engaged with BIT and prepared a full on the ground outreach campaign across the jurisdictions participating in the pilot. This uh, team of individuals was able to engage the core demographic, understand their problems more, ensure effective communication. And this, we found this really useful. While social media, digital marketing can have an effect. However, it didn't really fully resonate with this population. Uh, we found that the value of in-person visits and physical outreach was very effective. The migration of existing payment systems uh, for like recurring payments, benefits, uh, tax refunds, supply chain, et cetera, those use cases um, were very useful as well. So delivering those types of use, use cases, benefits, disbursements, um, requires careful consideration so as not to disrupt individuals and businesses that rely on those payments. So while these are important considerations, we also don't want to disrupt the lives of, of users. So in closing, looking ahead, as central banks continue to design, develop, and deploy their CBDC systems, a variety of stakeholders will need to collaborate. It's a big effort and collaboration is key to leverage those lessons learned. Those with extensive knowledge about the local economy, culture, and financial system will collaborate with firms who have the expertise in rolling out digital payments products and services, who will in turn collaborate with the central bank and the regulated financial institutions and payment services providers in the financial system. It is important to keep in mind that the economic needs the economics need to be sound for the financial institutions and payment services providers to also offer their services that leverage the CBDC infrastructure as well. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, now is the time for your burning questions to be asked and uh, answered hopefully by Stephen. And uh, I encourage you 
to engage. This is a open forum and any, anybody can ask questions. Anybody can talk to us all. Uh, please, if anyone has questions, please do ask. Stephen, this is Dan Schwartz. Just a question. So um, putting something in production is a unique experience. Putting something in production um, at the consumer level, even more so. Can you speak to any lessons learned um, from the rollout? Sure. Um, I'm trying to pinpoint exactly you know because, where I should take this. Because wasn't that the whole uh, talk about? <laughs> maybe, is there any is, can... is there anything specific, uh, Dan, that you want to ask him? You know, um, apologies, I didn't mean to ask you to redo your talk. Um, I think that there are probably some real pain points that that you, you know went you went through. Um, maybe the talk was a bit more the tops of the waves um, kind of presentation. Um, you know, something specific like you would either wish you would never wish you had done more of, or wish you would never do again. Sure, sure, I can definitely go there. <laughs> no problem. Um, so definitely, I would suggest uh, doing this again. Uh, the value propositions, which I mentioned, are super important. Making sure that you can go to market with a key reason why to use this product. So um, it's you know it's typical for go to market strategies with uh, fintechs. So you know you need to deliver that minimal, lovable product. What key set of features uh, do you need to have? to ensure the success of the project at go life. Um, so that could be a particular uh, user journey, a particular use case um, that will resonate with the tar target demographic. To give an example, uh, bill payment is one use case that uh, at BIT we found very pivotal for driving adoption. I myself use these products for bill payment. I mean, I can sit at home I can fund my wallet and I can pay my bills and I'm still on the couch and it's amazing. And I can do it all from my mobile app. And uh, for this particular jurisdiction, that is a game changer because people generally would either pay online with their, uh, with their commercial bank or they would have to stand in line. So to offer this, offer that convenience to individuals who may not have a bank account or choose not to have a bank account because of maybe high cost for owning a bank account. Um, you know, that's a key value proposition that you can convince a population, hey, you should get this product because this would allow you to do X, Y, or Z. So having that um, uh, clarity and messaging, I think is uh, something that you definitely need to have. When people think about the product, they need to understand why it's important for them to uh, know about this product and to consider participating uh, using the product. Um, leveraging the local expertise, uh, one of the points I mentioned is also super important. So having those stakeholders who may be battle tested, um, who you know, those fintechs who may be battle tested, who may understand their customers very well, uh, bringing them along for the ride, um, letting them participate is also, I, in my opinion, very important because they bring a lot of expertise. They, they already have brand identity built up and um, having them participate also adds value to them and to the CBDC. Uh, ideally, you want a very inclusive ecosystem where different uh, participants uh, like fintechs and, and payment services providers can leverage the CBDC infrastructure to provide a, a safer asset than uh, a mobile money token or, or a private or synthetic CBDC, uh, CBDC. And then the one of the things we would definitely use again is that 
concept of boots on the ground, individuals who can actually go visit merchants, give them a demo, show them tangibly how it works, how it can add value to their business. That's also super important. I mean, you can watch an ad on YouTube, you can see something in the press, in the paper, but until someone brings it to you in a way that you can absorb it, um, you may have problems adopting it. It just seems like something out there in the ether but having that person bring it to you and show you how it can add value to your business, how it can transform your business with maybe e-commerce payments or uh, reducing the need to have physical cash and to manage physical cash. These types of um, in-person outreach are, you know, I can't overstate it enough. You know, people may have some technology hesitancy and having someone face-to-face to break it down for them, I, I think that, that that's super important in this jurisdiction. It may not be the case in all jurisdictions, but these are some of the lessons that we, we will take with us as we move to other jurisdictions. I see Looks a like hand up from Brad, yeah. Thanks for doing this and hosting the call, um, and taking these questions. Um, I just had a few questions. One, um, <laughs> you didn't really talk about like what the startup cost is for the central bank to develop and deploy the system. Um, I'm just curious about that. Also, from a volume or a payment volume perspective, um, or just even if you can comment on the level of engagement you're seeing across the five territories with the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank that you've already deployed. And then lastly, I'm curious, like what is the ongoing cost uh, for any central bank uh, that manages the digital currency? Uh, does BIT charge like a percentage of transaction processed or a small fee or how does that work? Okay. Um, well, as you can imagine, this is all very sensitive information. So I'll be very careful here. Um, so this technology is provided uh, to central banks uh, through licensing. Uh, the deployment is owned and operated by the central bank. Uh, so it's provided to them through licensing. Um, with regards to the level of engagement, the volume of transactions, it's been steadily growing. As you could imagine, um, you know, the global pandemic, COVID-19, that has really driven adoption aggressively. Businesses now want to do more online they want to learn about it. E-commerce solutions play a big role, especially in the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union where uh, traditional e-commerce solutions were generally prohibitive. Um, you know, you needed to have a, a bank account and you needed to have a large deposit to gain access to the uh, Visa MasterCard gateways. So having a local infrastructure, local in quotes, a local infrastructure that can facilitate e-commerce payments was also pivotal in driving great adoption. And, and again, having those specific use cases, being able to pay your bills, uh, being able to purchase online using the e-commerce solution that we provide, these are, are super important for driving adoption. So the pilot in this case um, has limits around adoption. The central bank wants to use this period to test so they, you know, it is uh, a pilot by invitation only. And um, we are definitely hitting those numbers with regards to merchants. Uh, we are oversubscribed with merchants at the moment and uh, consumers as well. So it's going very well. Um, transactions still need to see some improvement, um, but the ECCB is looking to address that with a broader marketing campaign. So, um, it's not as great as we would like to see it, but it, it, it isn't bad and it's going very well. I hope that answers your, your questions, Brad. I was just asking that as you go forward, um, you know, you license, I guess, your digital currency management system. Is there an ongoing role financially that it has with uh, the central banks? Yeah, there is opportunity for ongoing role for maintenance and support of the system, as you could imagine. So we will continue to um, upgrade the system, uh, you know, deploy new features as a central bank would want. Um, so yeah, there's definitely an ongoing role to keep support for the system ongoing. 
And uh, just a, one last question. Um, I know there's a lot of activity. I saw that you guys are in the final 15, I think in Singapore. Yes. Um, can you comment uh, more about, um, you mentioned earlier China and India are, are, are considering systems. Are there any other countries you'd identify as that people should watch to see uh, what their pilots might look like and areas where you think uh, it has a good opportunity? Sure. So we recently, as I mentioned at the top of the presentation, we recently got awarded the contract to deploy the e-Naira, um, which is the Nigerian dollar, digital version of the Nigerian currency, which is a huge win, largest economy in Africa. Um, and I think uh, Nigeria will play an important role as an influencer through for other territories in West Africa and Africa in general. Um, I think for now, majority of the Early movers are those develop, developing economies, economies that have issues with financial inclusion. In my opinion, those are the ones that are moving more quickly than the more developed economies like in Europe, et cetera. Um, financial inclusion plays a role. And then some of the efficiencies that can be had from a CBDC are kind of convincing central banks to move faster. Uh, so I would suggest that, you know, any jurisdiction, um, you know, uh, large numbers of jurisdictions, upwards of 80 percent from the last uh, Bank for International Settlements um, survey show that many of the central banks globally, monetary authorities globally are investigating CBDCs. And it's also important to plug uh, Hyperledger here. You know, our infrastructure is built on Hyperledger fabric. And um, we've been using that technology now for maybe three, four years, and it's been going wonderful. Stefan, yes, hi. Seems... Thanks for the uh, <clears throat> presentation. Very interesting. One question I have is: uh, uh, Does the solution you are presenting does that does those solution work out, uh, offline? Because um, uh, we're looking at this from uh, from a European perspective, and of course, and uh, and basically, we, we seem to come to the conclusion that if you really want to have a cash alternative, you need to have something that works fully out offline. But then the question is, you know, how do you implement AML KYC checks offline as well? So I was wondering if uh, if you could uh, if you could elaborate a little bit on that uh, offline topic and uh, functionality and how, how does offline works with uh, Hyperledger or DLT technologies? Sure, so we are uh, currently developing um, an offline solution. It's kind of the unicorn of this space. Um, it's not an easy solution to implement uh, because it introduces additional risk if you don't uh, if you don't, you know, risk for double spend, et cetera, if you don't implement it uh, properly. So we are currently filing for um, some patents for this. So I really can't discuss too much. Um, however, I will say that it's in the works and um, I can offer that the Bank of Canada has released some interesting uh, papers around opportunities for offline payments, looking at specific hardware as one option, as well as um, this Central Bank of Bahamas, they've, imp they've implemented a, a separate infrastructure to facilitate payments where the internet is not available. So in a nutshell, there are a few paths you can take for offline payments. Um, you know, with a, with a ledger that's online, settlement still needs to happen on that ledger unless you want the ledger to reside on the mobile devices. So it's a very complex problem. No one in market has actually solved this yet. Um, one of the things that um, the, the, the competition with Monetary Authority of Singapore, um, I think offline solutions is one of those um, items that will be discussed there. So we will get to see some of the cutting edge solutions and technologies. So you can definitely look out for a bit and our presentation there on offline as well. Okay, thanks. Anyone else? I guess um, it's my turn now. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we have, uh, you know, um, talking about offline, 
-hmm. uh, there are several, uh, let's say, strategies to yes. deal with this. Um, the Chinese seem to have a strategy to deal with this, which is a multi-pronged approach with mm -hmm. the limits on the wallets and tiering of the wallets. That means mm -hmm. no AML KYC for uh, uh, amounts that are low and you can only transact so much using those. And plus it's, it's meant to be a pure peer-to-peer -peer system with uh, phones communicating with each other, uh, creating that uh, interaction. So that's the first thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Eventual consistency is the aim because that's obviously uh, will prevent the double spend problem, but the wallet design becomes very important there. Mm -hmm. uh, the other presentations that we have had in this space include uh, people who have implemented uh, very um, strong smart card solutions for this, which are, uh, you know, which do not need internet, but they still need electricity because I mean, electricity is available for a, a card processing device, uh, but again, it needs to communicate somehow uh, in the end to some. Um, yeah, it needs to settle eventually. <laughs> yes, yeah. but we have that, you know, we have that settlement, uh, the net, uh, net settlement uh, problem already handled by central banks quite effectively uh, where they do, you know, uh, liquidity management through settlement that is not, you know, immediate, mm -hmm. but then, you know, they use uh, intermediaries. Anyway, so I, I just wanted to put that out there because we have, that material in our uh, presentations, and I can actually uh, put that up in the uh, in the meeting minutes, so that people can actually link to those presentations to see the offline capabilities. And I noticed that a couple of people here uh, are working on that problem, but I think uh, the guy who I wanted to uh, invoke is not around right now because he is the uh, vice chair of the financial inclusion task force in DCGI. Uh, the question that I have for you is one, uh, the eNaira project is on a totally different scale uh, because the number of people in Nigeria is I don't know. I don't know what the multiplier is. Probably ten or 50, even hundred times more than the people in uh, in uh, and plus there are a lot of more sophisticated uh, people in Nigeria. Uh, you know, and Nigeria is of course well known for some other activities which we shall not go into right now, but which should be a problem for something like a central bank digital currency. So um, my question is, how do you, uh, you know, envisage scaling this solution or taking the solution to Africa, to Nigeria in particular, um, from your experience in ECCD? Yeah, thank you for the question. So, <clears throat> of course, being able to scale the solution effectively was a big kind of uh, determining factor for the central bank in Nigeria in choosing that, um, you know, Nigeria has over 200 million people and um, the idea is for most, if not all of these citizens to have access to Inaira. So, um, scaling the infrastructure is important and uh, we've been able to demonstrate through low testing etc that we can uh, definitely meet the demand using hyperledger fabric 
at least for now, uh, given the existing projections that the um, central bank has uh, purported for um, determining their selection. Um, so in a nutshell, we use a cloud infrastructure for, for this deployment, and we are able to scale that effectively to meet the transactions per second requirements that the central bank had um, put out there. So um, yeah, we're, we're, we're good. We are confident and we've done the little testing to demonstrate it. So it's, it, you know, we're, we're happy to move forward and to see it happen in, in real life. Are those figures public or do they have, are they not? Currently Maybe. not public, but we will likely publish uh, something soon. And there, there are a number of opportunities within Hyperledger itself for performance scaling as well. Um, so not just adding new nodes and orders and, and uh, validators, but there are other configurations within Hyperledger. You know, you can modify various things like block size and you know, various other key components to facilitate the transaction velocity that you, that you need to see. Yeah, I mean, I'm a member of the uh, Performance and Scale Working Group we have had uh, probably about three different uh, main ways of doing this. One is uh, changing the infrastructure itself. Uh, that mm -hmm. is uh, fast fabric. The other is um, doing things on the front end that group the transactions in different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, the third is uh, creating uh, faster processing using two things. One is cryptographic uh, acceleration using mm -hmm. uh, GPUs, mm -hmm. which is uh, work engaged with uh, Xilinx, which have now, they have now taken over the performance and scale working group. The other is um, the uh, work done by Oracle, where they created uh, in-memory databases rather than databases that are that have to store the transactions, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in a durable way, but they have very strong in-memory capability, and that uh, increases the transactions. So a combination of these methods should certainly yes. uh, get to around twenty thousand TPS. Mm -hmm if not more. Now, right. uh, are you using the latest 2.4.2 or are you using an earlier version of Fabric? We're still on an earlier version. Um, uh, and just because of the fact that we needed to move quickly at this point in time. Um, but as you remember, our infrastructure is lightly coupled to the blockchain. So it allows us to upgrade very easily. So we do have on our internal roadmap uh, the need for upgrading. And I also note that Fabric uh, from 2.0 onwards has, uh, has more support for, for, for tokens, um, which is something that we are also looking at and considering as well. Well, you might, uh, you might look at um, something like the uh, uh, presentation by Oracle on tokens, mm -hmm. uh, which, which covers a lot of ground. Two things. One is use of standards to create the token, like IWA standards, but also linked to that is the use of uh, the most commonly used standards in Ethereum, ERC-20, ERC-721, ERC-1155. ERC 1150, I mean, so they have created a parallel uh, implementation of these standards using these two techniques on Hyperledger Fabric. I don't know whether they, uh, that is uh, public, uh, meaning open source or not. Right. So that's, that's a very interesting set of uh, developments that should help uh, the tokenization further. Uh, yeah, so in, interestingly, um, tokenization is probably also 
one of the opportunities for offline uh, because yes. if you can yes if you can create um, or without saying too much if you can find a way for your CBDC to become a true bearer instrument and if you know what I'm saying you know what I'm saying then that 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 really advances the opportunity for offline payments because you're trans literally transferring value from phone to phone. Um, and that's that's one of the areas that we're investigating as well. Well, e-currency claims uh, that they already have that solution and they are implementing in, a, um, I think, one of the um, central banks. Okay. Yeah, so they already have that, you know, I don't know the technical details because it is a closed source uh, present, you know, it's a closed source uh, implementation. They do not make their internals uh, known, which I think is a mistake in most of these uh, implementations because uh, open source have been shown to be less um, prone to attacks because there are more people looking at the code or whatever. You know, there are a lot of ways in which opening up that code allows researchers to um, deal with uh, this, you know, this important topic. And if everything is closed source, then you won't know until you've been attacked that you've been attacked. Exactly. Yeah, and that, <laughs> and that was one of the key reasons why we went to Hyperledger Fabric because, um, you know, there's a whole community keeping it safe and um, advancing the technology it allows Bit as a company to focus on the layers above the blockchain uh, to add value to clients. And the, the, the blockchain, it becomes like a database almost. Um, so that was one of the key, key factors for us as well, the open source ability. Well, just having open source is not enough to protect uh, the, the protect anything that is being uh, done with that infrastructure. As we have seen, um, first of all, you know, most companies have are using open source, even though they are not even aware of it, because mm -hmm. underneath it goes down into the bowels. If you even use Linux or any, any open source technology there, that can be, a, a, you know. So I have, um, actually been spearheading a movement to increase the um, supply software supply chain um, sort of transparency and uh, let's say uh, using automatic audit tools when you're checking the code in. And I've already run this on many Hyperledger components, and let me tell you, I have found uh, many that are not up to the standard and I've notified the people. And I want to make this part of the build process itself so that when you check anything in and you're bring, bringing in new dependencies that you're not dependent on something that has already known to have uh, problems. Right. And that can be easily, uh, you know, attacked. Mm -hmm. So that brings us to the next question, which is, um, you know, the security. I, I briefly touched upon it when I asked you about the Nigerian situation. Um, what kind of continuous monitoring or auditing processes that you you have? in order to detect such attacks when they are in progress? That's the first question. Second question, what if you detect those attacks, do you have a way to short circuit or uh, pause the uh, infrastructure so that large amounts are not drained in a short period of time? This uh, technique is used in, uh, let us say, in, in even in stock exchanges, because when a when a stock falls, 
by a certain huge percentage in a short period of time, they disallow any All more trading. transactions. Yeah. yeah. So they, they have those kind of uh, circuit breakers. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so the two questions, one is the monitoring. Uh, do you use AI or something for that? And two, what happens when you detect problems? Sure. So um, security, I know enough of security to know that, um, you know, you need to be an expert in security. And uh, we do have those experts on staff and the central banks, uh, our clients, they also employ those um, experts. So I can tell you that we do have real time monitoring through third party uh, service providers, as well as inbuilt monitoring provided by the cloud providers as well. So there are multiple layers of monitoring and support. Uh, looking at stuff from CPU usage to incoming requests, you know, all the usual things you would expect. Um, and the central bank clients that we have have been very uh, bullish on ensuring that they can meet the highest standards for security for their deployments. Um, regarding the ability to pause, um, yes, definitely. Um, you know, we have a whole threat monitoring framework, et cetera. And within there, um, central banks have the ability to pause uh, the network and to take any corrective action as, as they deem fit. Um, we are the service provider, we provide the infrastructure, but the central bank um, handles most of the operations. So they have the ability to pause the infrastructure if something isn't right or if they are, uh, they want to limit uh, the impact of any nefarious activity on the network. They can definitely do that. Well, interesting, uh, you talk about pause again, uh, because um, in the IWA standards, that is one of the interfaces available. Um, in fact, when we created the um, ePaler project in, inside uh, Hyperledger Labs as a sub-project of uh, Capital Markets Group, money, I see money on the, on the call, uh, he, implemented most of it. I helped a little bit, but uh, the main thing that we did was we were able to call this function pause. But I think um, forgetting that the so-called security experts um, uh, have, uh, what I, I'm telling you why, because Microsoft, which is one of the biggest uh, software providers in the world and probably has more security experts than the entire population of bah Bahamas <laughs> or, or <laughs> Eastern Caribbean. Uh, right. They were hacked with, uh, uh, with um, you know, with using some techniques from software supply chain attacks. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so just having the, uh, the experts it's not enough. Uh, you have to continuously uh, uh, be humble. Yes. And make this uh, part of the infrastructure itself. Uh, security by design, security as a uh, first class sort of a process. But I think the most important part of that is automatic monitoring and even probably automatic circuit breaking, but you don't want false positives there. Because exactly. obviously, exactly. obviously you don't want to pause if nothing is wrong. Right. So and that and that automatic pause can also create a, a threat vector as well, you know. Um, yes, because someone, uh, someone somebody could look to trigger that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So all of these things, you know, there's a lot of uh, discussion all these techniques yeah. which are yeah. which are very uh, humbling to most of us and i think um, larger juris jurisdictions like china india and nigeria are going to be very uh, ripe for uh, these kind of attacks because the amount of money involved is huge yes yes um, so yes on on that point it's been 
very good working with the Central Bank of Nigeria because they have, as you mentioned before, a quite an advanced payment system infrastructure. So they are, have been sharing some of the tools and, and mitigations that they have in place to help um, sh shore up the um, CBDC infrastructure as well. Um, they've been coming with um, additional requirements and additional things that they see could be useful to help. And that's been very useful as well. Um, having that expertise from them, um, having had, you know, you know, they operate these payment systems today. So they are very familiar with how to protect them. And, um, you know, they do things a little differently. And it's very been, been very interesting to learn from them about that stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's a collaborative game. Um, anyway, yes. we are coming to the end of this uh, presentation. Just in case anybody else has any other questions, this would be the ideal time to ask. Yeah, thank you so much, Stephen, for joining us today. It's um, so great to hear about your experience and really hear about the lessons learned. Like we really, um, uh, you know, there aren't many live CBDCs. And so to hear from your perspective on how it's been going and what you would do differently next time is so valuable to our community. Um, Maybe you could just finish it off with sort of what you see is ahead. What's up ahead for um, um, BIT in the next year? And also just what, from your point of view, what you see, um, uh, how you see this space developing in the next year or two. Sure. So for BIT, I see um, more deployments. You know, we have a healthy pipeline of clients coming down the line. Um, uh, you know, more features, uh, deeper integrations with existing payment systems and payments infrastructures in different jurisdictions. Um, and uh, the second question was what, if you remind me? From your, from your yeah. point of view, working on a live CBDC and seeing, you know, all the different experimentations being done out there. Um, you know, there's a the recent BIS speech from Benoit Carré talking about how central banks need to um, accelerate. So just kind of from your perspective, where how you see this is going to accelerate in the next year or so. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So for me, I see um, the next year probably we will see a lot more retail level cross-border payments. Uh, CBDCs to CBDCs. Um, there's a huge opportunity there for innovation and reducing costs and driving value to at the last mile. So consumer to consumer cross border with CBDCs. Um, I think that that's something that you, we may see some additional progress on um, in the in the next few years as we see dependency on the U.S. dollar. There are lots. There's lots of conversation on reducing the dependency on the US dollar as a kind of a, a rail for, for cross-border payments. Um, so being able to do atomic transfers between CBDCs is something that I think we may start to see some more of in the next 12 to 16 months. Awesome. Thank you so much. And, and we look forward to the, the announcement for the uh, MAS challenge and and seeing um, your project and the others that are using Hyperledger um, come out of that. So there's lots of lots of news to catch up on um, and await very soon. Thank you so much, Karen. Thank you again. Um, and hopefully we'll catch up uh, in about six to eight months to see how things are going. And, uh, yeah, what sure. I'd love to bring. I'd love to come back again and talk about Nigeria at some point. Yeah. Yes, that'll be the next one. <laughs> great. Thank you, Stephen. All right. Have a great afternoon. Have a great day. You too. Thank you, sir. Bye. See you. Bye. Thanks. Bye.